All right. Uh, well, I don't know what time is on your side. Probably most of the people uh, is uh, around noon, and for me, it's early morning uh, at 6 a.m. And welcome, everybody. So this is a, uh, uh, a webinar which is organized by the IEEE MTT Society. And MTT stands for Microwave Theory and Technology. And this particular webinar is uh, organized under the uh, MTT Society Education Committee. So this is called a Distinguished Microwave in, uh, Instructor Webinar. So the purpose of this webinar is to introduce microwave technology to lower level undergraduate students and where they are still studying the circuits and you know maybe device uh, theory. So we would like to introduce the microwave field to them. And the microwave is a very exciting field. And we have a fantastic technologies, wireless technology and, uh, and other technologies. And uh, today we have three uh, you know, world famous professors who are here and share with you know, uh, the students about their, their view of this field and the exciting applications. And uh, my name is Sean Gang. I'm a professor at the University of Central Florida uh, in, in the United States. And our first speaker is Professor Maurizio Bozzi, and he is an IEEE fellow. And he received the PhD degree in electronics and computer science from the University of Pavia, Italy, and where he's currently a full professor. And he was also with the University of Darmstadt, Germany, and the Ecopolitik of Montreal, Canada. His research interests include substrate integrated waveguide, sensors, and the novel materials and the technologies for microwave circuits. And he has a very interesting talk today and really uh, go through the history of the microwave and uh, you know, wireless communication uh, technology and all the way to the wearable sensors. Our second speaker is Professor Nuno Cavajo, and he is also an IEEE fellow. He received the PhD degree in electronics and the telecommunications engineering from the University of Aveiro, Portugal, where he is currently a full professor. And he is also the MTT president elect, which means that he will become the MTT society president next year, 2023, and the director of electronics department at his university. His more recent research interests include wireless power transmission and backscatter communications, which is really uh, important for you know, how to reduce the power consumption for communications. The last speaker of today is Professor Andy Zhu, and he is an IEEE fellow. He received the PhD degree in electronic engineering from University College of Dublin, Ireland, where he is currently a professor. His research interests include high frequency nonlinear system modeling and the device characterization techniques, high efficiency RF power amplifier design, wireless transmitter architectures, and the nonlinear system ident identification algorithms. And he's going to talk about uh, you know, how, uh, how you design you know, the active circuits and also make them more efficient. Last slide of mine is. Uh, a, an opportunity which is related to a lot of undergraduate students. MTT Society offers undergraduate student scholarships, and there are two application deadlines of the year. And the, uh, the upcoming deadline will be October 15th. And uh, if you want to find the details and application forms, please follow the link in the slide. Okay. And now let me turn my podium to uh, Professor Maurizio uh, Bozzi. Maurizio, please let me stop sharing. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Hyun, for your introduction. Can you hear me? Yes, very well. And I try to share my screen. I should be in preview mode now, if everything works well. Is it okay? Yeah, it looks really good. Go okay. ahead. So, uh, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. It's a great pleasure for me to to be here and uh, uh, present uh, this, uh, uh, give this presentation for uh, mainly for uh, undergraduate students. So they are somehow the the target of this uh, uh, DMI initiative. 
And what I will present uh, uh, today is a kind of a, a long trip uh, uh, from the uh, origin of uh, uh, applications for micro technologies uh, in uh, uh, systems for everyday life from the past to the present and looking towards the future. Uh, I have organized my presentation in two parts. The first part will be a description of the evolution of uh, RF technology, let's say starting from uh, 40 years ago, from the applications that were common uh, 40 years ago, uh, to come to the recent years, so what we are using today, and looking uh, at the future. So what can we expect for uh, the next decade? That means, uh, what are you going to design, you uh, new engineers that are now uh, students, uh, when you will come to the profession? So we try to look at this uh, uh, point from uh, the, let's say, the, this problem from the point of view of the applications, but also from the point of view of the technology. So the other way to look at the same problem is not just uh, what do we have and what we will have uh, in terms of application, but also what do we need uh, to implement uh, these applications, which are the knowledge, which are the aspects that we have to develop if we want that uh, these applications become real for, uh, for, our, for our life. So let's start from uh, the impact of micro technology in everyday life 40 years ago. Uh, most of you probably were not even born uh, 40 years ago, you are much younger, but uh, when uh, I was a child or when probably your parents were childs, the impact of communication technology was limited to few uh, devices. One was the, the phone, the fixed, fixed phone connected uh, with a cable to typically to the wall. The second one was the radio. And the third one was uh, the TV. All the old TV without a remote control. And if you think of these uh, three objects that uh, were very common uh, 40 years ago, well, in the first case, uh, the signal was coming through a cable. So we had a guided wave propagation, bringing the signal to the device. In the case of the radio, we had uh, an antenna that was integrated with the device. It was a a uh, dipole antenna that was uh, orient uh, that you could orient to optimize uh, the reception of your signal, and uh, for the TV, there was a bit more sophisticated antenna. There was a Yagyu antenna located on the roof. In this case, it was still a dipole antenna with some parasitic dipoles that were used to uh, are still used to improve the the performance of this antenna. But somehow, it was a uh, very limited number of devices, very simple communication systems. If you think at what we have today, well, first of all, we have the mobile phones. Here you can see a number of examples of uh, uh, mobile phones coming from the first uh, uh, Motorola uh, device to the most recent ones. And what you can observe is that uh, somehow the mobile phones changed a lot uh, along the years. And at first, uh, they become smaller and smaller. And uh, how is it possible? Well, because of integration. I integrated circuit developed. Uh, it was possible to integrate uh, uh, all functions in smaller and smaller circuits. And uh, so we could reduce uh, the size uh, of these uh, uh, mobile devices. But then suddenly, they started to increase. Uh, and the reason is, again, uh, integration because we were able to integrate multiple functions in a single device. So the mobile phone that we have nowadays uh, is uh, somehow very different in terms of uh, operations compared to the old one. It was just a phone. Now it's a kind of small computer that we can use for, uh, for many, many different things. But when you think of the mobile phone, from the technological point of view, you don't have to stop uh, at the applications that are the interface uh, that uh, that you use, but you have to look behind uh, the mobile device. You have to look at the network. So the 
technology that is needed to bring uh, your voice or your image from uh, one mobile phone to another mobile phone is a very complex system because there is a, a base station where your, your mobile phone connects to and then from a mobile station the signal goes to switch that uh, uh, addresses your call to either a fixed phone or to another base station that is connected to another mobile phone and it's a very complex network and this is uh, really the core of the system because the mobile device is just uh, what we see what we don't see is the complex part and this is what uh, uh, micro engineers typically uh, design. If you think at networks, uh, well, there is uh, also another kind of network that is uh, uh, very common, very uh, has a very large impact uh, in uh, in our life. That is the the Wi-Fi networks or the internet. So, if you think at uh, your uh, uh, office or your uh, your your uh, house. Uh, well, you have your mobile phone that can connect uh, to a, a, a wireless router and maybe connect to the TV or to a camera or uh, to uh, a printer or to the internet to exchange data from your computer to other computers somewhere else. And uh, the internet is uh, another very complex uh, network that uh, is becoming more and more critical because we want to transmit more and more data in a faster and faster way. So if uh, when you consider the communication, you have to think that uh, behind uh, the uh, possibility to download a movie in a very short time, there is a complex network that needs uh, to support uh, all these uh, all these operations. It's a complex infrastructure that supports uh, your uh, your requests. But if, when you think of networks, there is another network that uh, sometimes we don't consider, but is extremely important for, uh, for many uh, of our activities, the GPS. In this case, it is not a terrestrial network, it is a satellite network. So there are around 30 uh, satellites that uh, transmit uh, some information, and with a simple device uh, like the GPS receiver, we collect this information and we are able to reconstruct the point uh, where we are located with a very good accuracy with a accuracy of meters or for some in some cases even less than one meter and of course this is used when you are traveling in a new city when you drive in a new city and you don't know where to go this helps you to uh, to find your your way but also for uh, for uh, airplane navigations and for uh, for many other applications, very very relevant applications, and of course uh, the critical part uh, is the network of satellites that makes uh, the operation of this uh, uh, mobile device uh, possible. So again, the is the infrastructure. What we don't see is uh, is the critical part, the important part. Of course, there are many more. Uh, applications of microwave technology that we use uh, every day. One example is the microwave oven, where you use uh, a signal, a strong signal at 2.45 gigahertz uh, to uh, cook your food or to warm your food. And here you use the characteristics of the material, that especially the water, that absorbs uh, very well the uh, microwave radiation at that frequency. And so it transforms the microwave signal into heat. Another important application is related to sensors that can detect the presence of people for, for different applications. And also another uh, application of microwave technologies is the satellite TV that is becoming more and more popular. And uh, in this case, you have a simple and low cost uh, antenna that is uh, located on your roof or uh, on your balcony. And it receives a signal coming from uh, a geostationary satellite uh, that uh, permits to have the TV broadcasting in a, uh, in a way different from the terrestrial, uh, terrestrial signal. But now the question is, uh, what's coming next? What uh, can we expect uh, for, uh, for the future? Well, one uh, area where there is a strong development in the last year and is becoming very important is the one of wearable devices. 
The band watches uh, are already a reality. You can do a lot of things uh, with them. They again, they are becoming a, a small computer that you bring uh, uh, with you uh, everywhere. But there are also other applications of wearable devices. And here uh, I want to show an example of a work we did a few years ago in conjunction with the University of Ghent in Belgium. And it was a system for localizing uh, uh, firefighters inside, inside buildings. So we developed some antennas that you see here that was integrated uh, on the jacket of the firefighters in the points you see here on the shoulders, in, on the front and on the back and was used uh, to identify with a good accuracy the position of the firefighters inside the buildings. As you probably know, where you are inside the building, the GPS uh, based on satellite doesn't work well because uh, uh, you don't see uh, directly the uh, the satellites. Uh, you have uh, the signal that comes after uh, bouncing uh, uh, against the walls, and so this uh, somehow creates some inaccuracy in the localization. And if there is a, a firefighter that enters inside the building that is uh, burning, and uh, the person has a physical problem, you have to go and rescue the person with uh, in in a short time and uh, without just uh, uh, scanning all the floors uh, of the building. So you have to go and pick the person directly. And this was the reason why we developed uh, these uh, uh, localization systems. And uh, in this case, the antenna was uh, becoming a part uh, of the jacket. So it was uh, seamless. It was not uh, visible. It was just a part uh, of the jacket. And in this case, of course, uh, the use of materials that are different from the ones that we typically use for my micro applications was, was important because the material for this antenna was simply the infill of the jacket. So we had to adapt our technology to use the material that was uh, available in that case. But the same concept finds uh, even uh, more important applications uh, in, uh, uh, biomedical, in the biomedical field. With, uh, in the area of the so-called wearable sensors. Now, imagine that uh, you are sick and you have to undergo a number of, uh, of uh, medical exams. You have to measure your temperature, your blood pressure, your ECG, and so on. So what you typically do is, uh, if you are at home, you go to the doctor or you measure by yourself. If you are in the hospital, there is a nurse that comes and measures all these, uh, all these quantities. So now imagine that you have a, a t-shirt or a jacket that you can wear. And in this jacket, there are all the sensors that you need to measure these physical quantities. So you don't have to do anything. And automatically, all your physical quantities, temperature, blood pressure, ECG, EG, and so on, are recorded by, by the, automatically by this system. And if there is any problem, these systems communicate with your mobile phone and from your mobile phone, the message goes to your doctor or to the emergency to take the needed uh, countermeasure. So to provide you medicine or to send you an ambulance if it is something critical. Of course, this, uh, a system like this improves a lot the quality of life because you don't have to, you don't need a person that comes every hour to make uh, some exam, but automatically with uh, the frequency that, that you need, uh, it measures your physical quantities and uh, helps you to live in a normal way, but staying uh, under full control. So wearable sensors are another big area of development for the future. And of course, sensors are the key word that we need to keep in mind. Another area that is developing a lot and uh, everybody is talking about that is the so-called Internet of Things. And the Internet of Things, uh, the IoT, is a big umbrella under which there are a number of applications. Of course, the, the networks and the uh, IT as we know it today, but also public security and public safety, the monitoring of industrial processes, like uh, what we call in Europe Industry 4.0, the healthcare applications I just mentioned, the smart home, smart grids, and so on. And uh, again, uh, in uh, many of these applications, uh, you need the sensors. You need the sensor to monitor the industrial processes. You need sensor for your home to switch on the lights uh, or close uh, the windows uh, uh, at the right time or when there is a particular condition and so on. 
And uh, there is another point uh, that is quite uh, relevant for, uh, for this, uh, that is the energy management. So most uh, of these sensors are very small devices uh, that consume very little power. So it, it is not convenient or it's very critical to have uh, a battery that feeds uh, these uh, sensors. And uh, from time to time, let's say every six months, you have to change the battery to 1,000 sensors that you have in your home. It takes a lot of time, it creates a lot of pollution. So to avoid that, you could find a different way and collect this energy from the environment. For instance, by collecting the RF signal that is already there for the TV broadcasting or mobile phone broadcasting and so on. But this topic will be developed later in the second presentation by Professor Nuno Carvalho. Another area where uh, uh, we are going to have a lot of development is the autonomous driving, cars that drive by themselves with no need of uh, human intervention. And of course, this is uh, very interesting for many reasons. One is that uh, they are bound to reduce uh, the number of car accidents or possibly in the future reduce to zero the number of car accidents. The, Traffic could uh, become more smooth because uh, you can uh, organize uh, the uh, traffic, the, the, say the car movement, uh, in a more uh, clever way by uh, by using the information that you have from the different cars, and of course uh, you can change completely your uh, your way of thinking because uh, you don't have to bring your child to the school, but maybe you your child gets in the car and the car brings uh, the child to the school and comes back or vice versa. So this is uh, another area that requires uh, again uh, a lot of sensors, uh, again a lot of infrastructure for the communication and uh, uh, this is one of the promises of 5G. 5G will provide uh, the right infrastructure for allowing this uh, autonomous driving to become a reality. And again, about 5G, there will be another presentation, the third one, given by uh, Professor Andy Zhu, and he will talk about uh, uh, 5G and related, uh, related issues. So this is uh, more or less uh, the scenario that we can expect uh, in the next few years. Now the question is, uh, what do we need uh, to make all these applications real? Well, we need, uh, first of all, integration. Integration means that we, we should be able to combine uh, in a single efficient and low cost system the active, the active elements, the passive components and the antennas. And everything should be done in a very efficient way with low cost, uh, with low losses uh, and simple design rules. Now I show you two examples. Here you see a 94 gigahertz uh, radar sensor that is based uh, somehow on a classical approach. So you have uh, the different devices, you see here the baseband circuit, uh, the antennas, the frequency multipliers and so on. Everything is mounted on this board. For sure it works perfectly, but uh, somehow it is uh, a bulky system. Now look at this one. This is uh, again uh, a radar, this is a FMCW radar operating at 24 gigahertz. This was proposed by uh, Professor K. Wu and this group uh, something like 10 years ago. And you see that in this case, everything is uh, realized on the same board by using the same fabrication technology, this is so-called substantive waveguide technology. And on the same board, that is a 12 by eight square centimeter board, you have the antennas, the mixer, the baseband lines and so on. Everything, all the parts of the circuit are fabricated by using one single fabrication step in a low cost, uh, low cost way. So this is something that we should consider for uh, making all these applications real. Something that is simple to fabricate, simple to design, simple to fabricate, and possibly at a low cost. The second point that we need to consider is materials. So micro applications for many, many years have been based on the use of very few materials, like the alumina, the some selected uh, plastic uh, substrates, metal, and a few more materials. 
for some applications, we need to be ready to use unconventional material. We have seen the example of the antennas integrated in the jackets, where the, the material is the infill of the jacket of the firefighter. And there are some other applications where we can need different materials. One different material can be, for instance, paper. Paper is a low cost, is a flexible, so good for conformal structures. And it is also an eco-friendly material. If you want to develop sensors for agricultural applications, why don't you use paper? In this way, you distribute your sensor in your fields, and after a while, the sensor dissolves and leaves uh, no, uh, let's say, a garbage in a, or, or any, anything undesired in your field. Another material is a 3D printed material. 3D, 3D printing is becoming very popular for many applications, and even in the microwave field is important because it provides a lot of flexibility in fabrication. So you can produce uh, uh, devices with unconventional shape at a very low cost and in short time. So the use of uh, unconventional material is also another element that we need to take in mind to develop uh, our, our future applications. Another important point is related to sensors. Sensors are important for many, many different areas. And what we want uh, is uh, the availability of compact and low cost sensors that are able to characterize liquids and gases. And they have applications, for instance, in biomedical area, but also in the case of defense, in uh, many cases, identifying uh, quickly a, the presence of gases uh, could, be, could be very important in, uh, in defense scenarios. Of course, again, you want uh, good performance and low cost. This is uh, always the requirement uh, for, uh, for commercial applications. And here you see an example of a sensor that we produced uh, uh, a couple of years ago. And uh, it is a 3D printed structure in planar form by using the SIW technology made by 3D printing. So we try to combine uh, the, the best of the different technologies to have uh, an efficient sensor with a low cost and uh, low profile uh, technology. Last but not least, uh, energy management. As I already mentioned, we want to feed our mainly our sensors by avoiding the use of batteries. So there is no need of replacement. There is no uh, production of uh, undesired garbage. And of course, uh, this can be done by using uh, energy harvesting, in many cases, RF energy harvesting. And uh, this will be the topic of, uh, of the next presentation. And here you see an example. In this case, uh, there is an antenna that collects uh, the energy that is already in the environment transmitted for other applications. It uh, converts uh, this RF signal to a DC signal and uses that to feed a uh, circuit. This is a work made by a group uh, at uh, Georgia Tech by Professor Manuel Stenseris. So to summarize, uh, these are the four keywords that we need to keep in mind uh, for, for the next, uh, for next generation of, uh, of microwave devices. One is integration. One is materials, one is sensor, and the other is energy management. And which is the message for you, especially for the young students? Well, there is a variety of, uh, of different uh, skills that you need uh, to develop these uh, communication systems. So this includes, uh, of course, uh, micro and antenna engineers, but also experts in microelectronics, material scientists, and energy specialists. So the implementation of these systems uh, that uh, we use in everyday life that doesn't come just from one type uh, of engineers. It comes from the collaboration of uh, many experts uh, in different disciplines. And this is, I think, the most important message that you can bring home from, uh, from this presentation. And this concludes my, my talk. I think that we will have the questions at the very end of the three talks, and I will be very pleased to, to respond. Thank you. Thank you, Maurizio, for your nice presentation. And as uh, uh, Professor Bose said that, you know, if you have questions, please feel free to put in the chat. You know, the questions can be 
related to the technical presentation, also could be related to the career development for young students. All right, so our next speaker will be Professor Nuno. So could you please uh, share your screen? Hope you can see my screen. Let me can you see my presentation? Yep. Very nice. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. And first of all, thanks for the invitation to be here today. And um, it was good that Mauricio presented first because uh, he gave the kickoff to to this talk. So um, I'm Nuno Carvalho. I'm coming from the University of Aveiro in Portugal. And uh, as as said, I've I've been a volunteer for MPTS for many, many years up to now. And my uh, talk today will be on wireless energy and especially uh, net zero alternative for radio communications. And this is really uh, what is moving uh, my group at the recent times, because uh, as you saw with Maurizio presentation, there are so many wireless technologies, so many RF devices out there that the amount of energy that we really need for those solutions to operate is becoming harder and harder and, and, and strongly impacting the society. So um, I start my presentation with, with the background, that is the person from my point of view who was responsible for most of what we have today. And this person is uh, Guillermo Martoni, as you can see it in this photo. And uh, when he actually started to design radio frequency communications, um, he was not worried about how much energy he will spend to make the communication, because the communication was the central piece of his research and his activity. And from that point, as you can see here, the amount of artifacts that he has in the in the table to actually allow him to make a communication with the boat. And I, I took this photo because I really like these uh, old antennas for, for making this radio communication. So the amount of energy needed at that time was not on the central piece of design and radio communication systems. But if you see, and, and Maurizio already presented, from Marconi up to now, the number of wireless solutions, the number of wireless activities is huge. As you can see, you have a mobile phone everywhere. Everybody has a mobile phone. Uh, you have smartwatches. You have laptops that uses wireless communication. You have tablets. You have your games. You have your uh, mobile headphones. You have cameras going around wirelessly everywhere. You have satellites. You have GPS. and the amount of things goes on and on and on and on. And I strongly believe that the uh, main goal in the future is to remove the cables everywhere and everything can be actually using radio frequency and especially wireless communication links for all of these things. But what is the problem that we face at this moment? Well, the problem is not on the communication, as I said, because uh, we actually have quite interesting and quite reasonable communications already. Well, the problem is really that all these transceivers, so the receivers and the transmitters of all these technologies, they actually consume energy. And if you look to a traditional super heterodyne or if you want an homodyne uh, transceiver, which I will say 80 to 90 percent of your radio devices use a super heterodyne or homodyne uh, approach, you see that there are a lot of components there that consume energy. You have low noise amplifiers, you have uh, uh, variable gain amplifiers, you have ADCs, you have DACs, you have oscillators, you have mixers, you have power amplifiers, and all of these devices are consuming energy. So if all these devices are consuming energy and we want to remove the cables, to actually all this, you want to use a, a, a watch and do not think about connecting it to the power outlet, or you want to use your mobile phone for two or three days without thinking of recharging it, then we really need to take care of this energy. And there are two options, or you, ch you change the approach to charge these devices, or on the other sense, you reduce 
the way or you reduce the amount of energy you consume on the transceivers itself. So you try to minimize this power consumption. And uh, I can show you, uh, and I think this is very important for everybody uh, on, on, on our field, which is what is the impact of the information and communication technology sector in the footprint, in the carbon footprint at this point. And this graph is very nice. You, you can find it actually on, on the web. You, you see here that the current electricity use at this moment uh, is around 4% of global electricity. What that means, it means that 4% of global electricity comes from the ICT uh, road. And if you see on the, on the second graph, 1.4% are responsible for, uh, that is, the ICT is responsible for 1.4% of carbon emissions all over the, the world. And if you look to the, the line above, it says that between 10 to 20% of electricity consumption will come from the ICT sector in 2030. And uh, if you think a little bit, this is mainly to power up your mobile phone, your watch, your, your iPad, your, your sensor that you want to use in your um, clothes or your sensor in your shoes. And this is really bringing a huge stress on the energy consumption of all these devices all over the world. And as Mauricio said, we are moving very fast to the concept of the Internet of Things. What that means, it means that we want to put a sensor, we want to put a wireless device in everything we have, in our doors, in our chairs, in our food, in our kitchen. So everything is going to have an IoT solution. Again, I took these graphs from a report available also online, and you see that, of course, the battery power IoT devices, they are going to explode. So the number of devices are going to be very, very huge. And all of them are based on batteries. What that means? It means that the batteries that you put there, they are going to be responsible for charging your devices. And as you can see here, the standby energy of those devices is huge. You see the, the graph here is terawatt hour, terawatt. So, and this is the standby energy. What that means? It means the sensor is not doing nothing. It's waiting for a, a trigger to actually reply to the device. And this is really a very important problem, not only because you need a lot of energy, but you need to manufacture the batteries also. And as you see in this graph here, the battery manufacturing is quite huge. Again, terawatt hour. What that means? It means that uh, in average, uh, if you have a specific battery, the amount of energy you need to produce the battery is three to four times the amount of energy the battery contains. So if you multiply this by trillions of batteries, we have a real problem because we need to actually op opt to minimize this battery need. And the batteries have another problem, and the problem is garbage, because most of the batteries will go to recycling or go to garbage, but even the recycling or, or, or the garbage um, process will consume energy again. So you, we, we have a, another problem. That's why we start to think, how can we remove the batteries of these devices? Can we actually operate a radio transmitter a radio transceiver without any battery and without, of course, a power outlet to the wall because I want a watch. I don't want to bring a cable behind me. I want to watch to operate without a battery there. And how can we transmit and receive signals without a battery? And this is actually part of my talk today, is to show you that by combining the knowledge of RF engineers with the knowledge of uh, let me say system engineers, we can be able to produce in the future a completely net zero wireless device and wireless transceiver. So in order to show how this is possible, I will give you a very simple example. Uh, this example is a, a dark room where I want to have a sensor to communicate with me. And a very simple example I'm going to give you is imagine that you have a a lamp. So you have a flashlight. And I want to have a sensor that actually communicates with me. So one possibility to do that is very easy. Let me 
try to see if I can. Oops, I should have a video here. Okay, it's here. Okay. So what happens here is that I put actually my daughter on the other side of the room with a mirror. And what you can see, you see that when she moves the mirror back and down, you see that she's reflecting the signal to me. So how much energy she needs? Well, mainly to move the mirror up and down, nothing more. The concept of the transmitter is mainly the reflection of my signal, of my light. So you see, when, when she moves the mirror up and down, I send a flashlight and you can see the reflection back. So by using only a mirror, you can actually develop an on-off device saying that someone is on the other side. And actually, this is being used for many, many long years for by the Navy. Uh, and why? Because they use it to do co Morse code using light from the sun and actually reflecting the light from the sun for these uh, devices. Well, with this in mind, another person... When I come from position uh, eight, I will stop here. Another person called Leon Theremin start to design some years ago a very interesting device that I will show you that Carolina Hake is a, a, a player of Theremin. Theremin is a music instrument and you can say why we are using a music instrument for wireless communications. Well, because it actually shows how can you use the electromagnetic field in this case to make art, to make music, but what she will do, as you'll see, she will play music based on the reflection of, of the electromagnetic waves. So I, I, I will go back a little bit and you'll see a little as bit. As a little of trick, this. when okay. I come from finger position eight, I will first only move my fingers. And then if I go to this position, which I call position five, then I will also move my wrist and turn it and um, close my fingers together. Perfect. So I want to show you that we see only the reflection. And as you can see here, I have an antenna here. I have a receiver here. This is the other antenna. So I'm creating electromagnetic field here. And by perturbing the t this electromagnetic field, you, see, you receive a reflection of that electromagnetic field. And by doing that, we were able to actually send information, in this case, music. So Leon Theremin is known not only because of this instrument, but because Leon Theremin is the father of what it's called the Great Embassy C bug. What is this? This was actually the first wireless transmitter, a wireless microphone that was used for spying for, uh, several years ago. And this was actually uh, given to the American embassy by the USSR in 1946. And it stays in the embassy, in the wall of the embassy. This was a, a purely wood seal that stays there for six years. And nobody understood why the Russians were listening to what was happening inside the embassy. Because inside this seal, there was no battery. There was no active, active transceiver. But there was a small device actually developed by Leon Theremin, which is based on the same concept of backscattering, that is reflection of radio waves. So here you have your uh, actually sensor. And when you change, I have another image that you can see it better. This actually, you can find this in the Krypton Museum the online. So what you see here, the, you have a, a, a cavity here that resonates to your voice. And when you talk, you change the capacitive uh, impedance of this antenna. This is a very simple uh, quarter wavelength antenna. And when you talk, this antenna impedance changes. So if I reflect, if I illuminate my antenna, the antenna will re emit the signal back. And by changing the impedance of this antenna with your voice, you actually can change the amplitude of the reflection and do what it's called amplitude modulation. Again, as you can see, no battery, no energy is presence, present Sorry, in this device. The energy comes from this illuminating signal, exactly the same thing I show you with the, the flashlight. 
we send a, a signal and the signal that comes reflected can be on and off or in this case it was modulated and this is really the concept that i want to show you today and i think it's an amazing concept of how can we build devices how can we build internet of things and all these solutions using only reflection without consuming any energy and here you can see it a, a very simple example so we, we have a transmitting antenna we send a sine wave or radio frequency signal to your receiver if your receiver is short circuit part of the signal goes back if your receiver is matched the signal is going to be received absorbed by the receiver so if i have a way to control this impedance of this antenna like leon Theremin did i'm able to build actually a radio transceiver that do not need a local battery there so this is actually the concept of what you know as rfid radio frequency identification and rfid most of the time as you can see in this slide came to substitute the traditional barcode when you buy a product in the market so the, the rfid is a very simple concept as you can see here you have an antenna this is a dipole a folded dipole and here here you have a ship in the middle and the ship actually is nothing more than this you have a generator a signal sinusoidal generator the antenna receives that signal it has an rf to dc what that means it converts rf to dc power this dc power is able to power up a microcontroller that actually goes to the backscatter what is the backscatter is nothing more than a switch and why a switch because if i short circuit the antenna signal goes back if i don't short circuit the antenna the signal does not go back so i can do what it's called on off key switch on and off with on and off and transmit a digital signal back so this is a very basic concept of how to design a microwave circuit a radio circuit that does not need a battery but actually can answer to your to your questions and that's why i'm bringing this slide where we can actually by looking let me go back by looking to this rf to dc converter backscatter we can actually combine the brilliant ideas of these colleagues nikola tesla by sending energy to the sensor Leo Theremin by creating the concept of the backscatter sensor and Guillermo or Marconi by creating the communication artifact that is able to communicate with this passive. I call it passive because they don't have a local battery there. So the combination of all these ideas were able to actually create a major concept of backscatter IoT devices. And one of the examples, I will not go through this very uh, far but one of the examples of how these operate is that uh, is is uh, we can attribute this to nikola tesla where we actually can create a wireless power transmission link so we create a sine wave and that sine wave is sent to my sensor and in my sensor if you are an electrical undergraduate uh, student you probably have circuit analysis in your course the rf to dc converter to convert back this rf back to dc is nothing more than a diode rectifier very simple single diode rectifier and you can have a wireless power transmission link there by the way we we actually build some of uh, these transmitters in our lab this is one of our transmitters with the 16 element it's an active antenna array what that means it means that i can follow i can create a focus of energy and i can follow the sensor even if the sensor moves i can go around him and i can focus the energy there and uh, we combined we designed microwave circuits that actually combine this wireless power with backscatter you can see a very simple example here so you have the antenna this is actually our RF to DC converter. As you see, we have a rectifier, simple diode rectifier. And here I have the backscatter. And the backscatter, the traditional RFID backscatter, is mainly a switch. It's a, a transistor that switch on and off and send back a, a amplitude modulated signal. Well, if uh, you, I will go through what we have done in the last year. So in 2015, we create our first passive sensor based on this backscatter communication. Actually, if you are familiar with the SMIT chart, this is where we match the circuit. And uh, in one position, the circuit is matched. In another position, the circuit is unmatched. So you can reflect back your signal. Then we actually 
stop, came up with an idea, why use only a, a switch? Why not use a two switches? And if you are familiar with modulation processes, we actually did an IQ backscatter modulator, which means that we were able to do quadrature phase shift keying or quadrature amplitude modulation on top of the backscattering. And uh, by doing that, we were able to create 16 different impedances of the antenna. What, mean, what that means is that this is, if you are familiar with modulation, this is a quadrature amplitude modulation format, but is done on top of the Smith chart, that is, is done with different, 16 different uh, impedances, and we were able to achieve gigabit per second with femtojoule uh, consumption in this in this scenario. Then we join the wireless power transfer, so we join our backscatter IQ modulator with wireless power transfer, and we were actually with this work, as you see here, this is the traditional Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, Zigbee, so the traditional wireless infrastructures, we were able to consume very, very low amounts of power, but achieve a very high bit rate with our sensor. But as always, and as a student, you'll see that when we go to the lab, we normally do these huge prototypes to validate an idea, but then we want to do it to be operational. So the next step was actually to build a ship, to build an integrated circuit that could be able to actually put our IQ modulator in a very, very tiny ship so that all sensors can have this type of sensor, uh, type of modulator without using battery. But nevertheless, you can if and you are thinking, and I probably believe you are thinking, okay, you don't have a battery, but you have to send energy to the sensor. You have to send this RF signal to the sensor. And you are consuming energy because you are sending the energy. But as Mauricio said a moment ago, we can do another thing. We can actually, instead of sending an RF signal to my sensor, I can use RF signals that are already on the air. And those signals include GSM, 3G, 4G, 5G signals include Wi-Fi, or in our group, we use music FM stations at 100 megahertz. What that means? Well, it means is exactly the same as we did with the mirror. You have signals that are already on the air. Imagine here a cell tower, you have a signal that goes to your sensor. And your sensor, depending, for instance, you want to transmit a temperature. So your sensor, what is going to do? is going to modulate this RF signal and is going to reflect this RF signal that is already there. And you only need a backscatter receiver. You only need, an, in our lab, as I said, we use a music FM stations. This signal is already there. It was, It is 10 kilometers away from my lab. We developed a tag that actually receives this signal and reflect the signal back to a low-cost software-defined radio that actually we build with this very low-cost pens, USB pens for software-defined radio receivers. So in this situation, this is called ambient backscatter, ambient in the sense that you use the signals that are already there. In this case, we were able actually to not have a battery and also not to generate a signal to actually power up our sensors. And another example, and this is my last slide that I want to show you that we did, was that we have all these remotes around the house. And if you uh, probably found that sometimes you lose the battery and you have to change the battery of these remotes. So what we did, we actually build a battery-less, completely passive remote control to change the TV channels. So as you can see here, I will stop a little bit. So you here you see our prototype. It only has four buttons. And this is actually the transceiver. So here we send the RF signal to my prototype, and my prototype backscatter the information that depends on the switch that I'm switching on. And this can change the TV. So what we are, for instance, only in Portugal, which is a tiny country, if all the remote controls were like this, we will be saving 20 million batteries per year only in this tiny country that we have if we move to the overall uh, world, you see this is, is really huge. So my last slide, I just want to tell you, if you are interested on these topics of wireless power transmission, backscatter communication, swiped, there is a group uh, that actually MTT is sponsoring, which is the WPT.IEEE.org, and uh, there are two conferences that 
uh, are very focused on these topics. One is the wireless power week that is going to happen this year in Bordeaux in France. And the other one is the RFID TA, which is going to happen also this year in Italy, uh, both in Region 8. So you are, of course, happy and we are happy to receive you there. So thank you very much for your attention. And this concludes my talk. Thank you, Nunu. <laughs> this is a very interesting talk. I think that it, this is really shows that how the technology, you know, we, we have to do sustainable growth of our, you know, the technology in order to protect our envir environment. I think this is a very, uh, you know, interesting point. Our next speaker will be Professor Ending Zhu. Uh, Ending, could you please share your screen? Yep, we can see your screen. Good. Okay, um, I might, should I start? Sure. Yep, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to continue talking about the talk, a topic about carbon footprint as the environmental issues, obviously, we all are facing. And first, I just, yeah, everybody talk about the climate change. Obviously, this earth is getting warmer. And this is a picture I just took in two weeks ago in Iceland. Actually, this glacier, <coughs> I was there, excuse me, <coughs> they melting very fast. So now the sea level actually in danger is rising, right? So this is a cause or issue caused by the CO2 emissions. So here's a chart um, and just showing excuse me, <clears throat> and the different sectors, um, they contribute to CO2 emissions. So this, for example, the industry and the energy sectors, huge uh, contribution to those and also agriculture's. So there's the, everybody need to do something, right? So people call in, so we have to cycle, cycling to the, to the school, to the, you know, office and using public transport and also eat less meat and use, uh, eat less dairy and also use more energy efficient, um, the, and utilize and recycling and also use renewable uh, energies to make the society more sustainable. It's really difficult now. So. We really need everybody need to do something about it. So now we talk about the like Professor Marzo already talked about earlier about the 5G. So the 5G basically the fifth generation uh, communication network. So this uh, this network's not just a uh, faster. It's going to be give you much higher uh, speed and data uh, data rate, and also give you a uh, much larger capacity. So main difference here is. Uh, the 5G different from the previous generation mobile networks is that not just to connect people. And if you look at the even the 4G networks, mainly focus on uh, mobile phones, right? So mobile phone mainly connect people. But now the 5G actually not just to connect people, it's mean they going to be connect everything. So from your uh, summer start at home and smart meters, refrigerators. The street lights, cars, trains, everything. Right? So they're going to be connect everything together, the machines and device, the IoT devices and so on. So this 5G really, you know, it's kind of create the unified this platform to make the connection. So this is going to be huge changing to the world and to our daily life. So this is a triangle uh, mainly showing the what the 5G can do. The first part of the talk here basically called enhanced mobile the broadband. This mainly create high speed data link. So they increase the increase the the uh, transmission speed. So this the bring the benefit for the benefit for if you play games you know remotely with other people. So you, there's a time response very important, right? So you have the very quickly to respond to those and then need broadband network connections. So this 5G going to provide a high much higher speed. And on the other hand, this they, they have the the like Professor uh, Marissa and, and then already talk about the IoT device called Internet of Things. Basically, the sensors. So if you put the sensors in the street lights um, to your building to everywhere, you can make uh, monitor those um, sensors and stuff. And then you can have better manage those buildings and energy consumption and so on. And on another corner here, it's called mission critical service. This is mainly related to some, you know, time sensitive uh, scenario. For example, you have the self driving vehicles and this need to respond very quick and then also robotic um, process in the manufacturing. So you have the precise control and very time sensitive. So you need to get those things correct. Those are uh, can create by the 
the 5G network. So then we talk about today, we talk about the environment. All right, so how the 5G can help reducing the CO2 emissions. So 5G creates, you know, connectivity, basically connect everything together. If they connect it, and then you can make automation, right? So you can remote control or you can put everything together, you can better energy management. And in that sense, you can improve efficiency of the uh, the system, right? So you can make the city much more even, the, the more efficient running this everything together. And uh, they can do remote healthcare, so you don't need to go to visit your patient. So you can, you know, you've got a doctor, so you can uh, remotely monitor your patient without traveling to to their home. So this already is, there's many study already done. They say the simple just if even just a simple connection of the vehicle and together by 5G, they can reduce 20% of the carbon and footprint. And then manufacturing obviously is huge benefit. So these uh, they reduce the tons of the the CO2 emissions. So the 5G is certainly going to be a huge benefit to the environment when they you know the, those network enable those all massive connections. But however, the 5G itself actually has a problem. So where's the problem? This is you might heard some news. They already news talk about you know the 5G going to be need significant increase the CO2 emission itself if you just rule out the 5G network, and they're going to be uh, pump you know billions tons of the CO2 into the uh, you know the atmosphere. It's going to be create problem. Another problem with this the energy is the network itself needs the energy. They, if you look at the China, they say the electricity demand for for 5G network or you know many many times of those existing um, the demand as the Professor Luna already mentioned there. There's a there's huge demand for those things, and then they say okay this 5G is a great benefit to reduce the couple uh, the carbon uh, footprint for the you know in other sector, but they actually self create the huge impact on environment itself. So how this, what, where's the issue? Actually simple, this is the number of the connected device increase. So that's what happened this today. And they, by statistic, obviously the number of always changing. So this is one of the studies showing, say every second, um, there's over 100 device connected to the internet today. So you can imagine, this is going to be billions, billions of device already connected and continue exponentially uh, increase. So this is going to be a huge problem. So the, and then the data, also, and the transmission through these different devices, the total data uh, transmission going to dramatically change. Right, so this costs um, the. As we know, that transmit any data and every bit consume energy. Right? So this this you know data transmission through the different devices moving more around. Even you know, Professor Nono said you can use in reflection, but the energy in the first place you need to generate our signal first. Right, so this or this energy transmission and need consume energy. So this and this again, there's another number already no no already mentioned that so there's up up to 20% of of the the electricity as they consumed by ICT and the network the system and only right so the, those are going to be huge demand. There's many data centers, for example, I mean, where I'm in in Ireland, we build actually the uh, electricity power plant particularly for data center, for Amazon's, for Google data center, they need a huge power um, uh, supply for those. So those power supplies are certainly going to be great and the CO2 emission, right? So they're going to be continue to increase those numbers. And then the, now, so what we can do, you know, there's the, the, the network, if you build the 5G network, certainly we need to do many, many uh, places, uh, you know, the parts. So first, uh, you need to use in more power efficient network, right? So even the 5G network already much more efficient than 4G or previous generation network, but we still need more power efficient hardware and we need to build more software and to control and also try to replace the uh, energy supply, say for example, in, in the current base station, mainly supply the power by the electricity network. But you might, you might need to use in and renewable energy, so that you wind wind farm to to power your base station, and to replace you know the current the the network, and also you can do the further um, and system level kind of planning to make it better manage the whole world, whole world network and make it efficient. Say sometimes the 
the network not being used or base station not trans no user use those network um using base station you might turn off the base station at that time and then total you need you know they they also can operate with other sectors because 5g provide the service for other for many different sectors so, so there's a demand and the different sectors need to collaborate with the operator itself to uh, to make the system more um, efficient so in, in summary, basically, we need really need make the 5G green or sustainable. Otherwise, this power consumption is a huge um, problem. Now, today we talk about, you know, how we, you know, what the RF or micro engineer can do, what, what our role in this, um, uh, this 5G um, system. So first we look at the network. If you, some of you may be familiar with the, the, the and also Professor Morris um, already mentioned this, build the, the center network basic operation, they have a tower, right? So the tower basically connects the internet to the, to the wired network. Then there's a tower gonna be built the transmitter and transceiver on the tower connect with your, wirelessly connect with your um, mobile phone. So this, if you build the network and they, we call the center, basically each of the tower obviously only cover a certain range because the signal attenuates through the air, right? So when they when the transmit it through the air attenuation, so they only can reach a certain distance. So center network basically they build multiple um, different tower put in a different location and each tower cover a certain range. Um, and it's called center. So in general, this this tower actually consume most of power. It's over fifty percent the power um, consumed by this um, the base stations because they go and be particularly now today the top of five four G network. The base station and uh, usually um, the hundreds hundreds of watts on on K or thousands of watts of those. So then we break down these and we talk about our micro engineer. What do we do here? Um, so they look at the, if you look at the tower, if you break down the tower inside the tower, obviously there is a software um, and, you know, they, there's other uh, piece um, uh, management things there. And uh, also um, this radio front end, right? So there's hardware, uh, software or both there. But they actually radio part, the radio front end part, again, this is the 50% of those base station, each of the base station here, the 50% of the power consumed by the radio front end. And so that's what we're aware of focus on. If you, if you work on our micro engineering, so you need to solve those hardware problems. So this is what we do say, okay, how to improve this, basically you improve the efficiency, right? So the efficiency improvement is very important in the ARP circuits and system design. Then we further look at inside the front end and as this is a simple kind of transceiver, um, the architecture, so you normally, you have the digital signal, which is your, your voice, your audio, uh, your, uh, we do, and so on. Those signal usually need put in the digital to analog converter. Then you need to transmit it through the, through the radio frequency. You, you do up conversion. So you cannot directly transmit your, uh, your audio, right? So you need, you learn the communication interior. You need to move in those frequency from the and low frequency to higher frequency. For example, the 4G network you use a 2.4 gigahertz frequency, uh, 2.1 gigahertz, and so on. So you use a mixer to multiply with your with your carrier signal, and then you send to generate R signal. So this is one particular and um, the element uh, which I'm working on, and also the most important element in the transceiver is the power amp, uh, power amplifiers. So what's the power amplifier doing? So basically just to enhance the strength of the signal. So the, because your signal, um, uh, when the signal transmitted through the tower to your mobile phone, they need, they need you know, in, enhance the signal uh, strength. Otherwise the signal attenuate, you cannot receive it. So there's a functionality for the, the power amplifier basically just increase the magnitude of the signal. It sounds very simple, right? So, but actually this guy, and uh, this is the PA part actually, um, the most important, I would say, the in the um, in terms of the energy uh, consumption point in the transceiver. So this is the PA actually consume again another fifty percent here. This is over fifty percent energy of the transmitter. So these and uh, you see this is a chart here showing the power part. Usually, you know, this is a typical base station and um, the power budget. So over fifty to sometimes it goes eighty percent of those power. 
And those power, and then unfortunately, this is power for actually not efficient. So you see, okay, we try to generate this signal and pump to through the uh, antenna, radiate to the air. But actually, the you put in the the efficiency of amplifier that's usually less than twenty percent, which means you're only when you put in the power connected to the PDA, only twenty percent energy actually radiate through the antenna to the air. And rest of 80% still stay inside the, the box. So you wouldn't be able to transmit out. So this is certainly the waste energy, right? So the, the basically generate the waste money here. And not just the waste, but also the generated heat. So have this thing, the, the energy still stay inside the box. So there's a heat as a problem. So you have to get rid of heat, otherwise, you know, the, the tower is going to be burned, right? So, so that's why you have, you see here, the chart here, there's air conditioning and system there. So each tower, they have to put in air conditioning to dissipate the heat. The heat must be get out. And this also get the problem with not, again, this air conditioning costs the power, right? So they consume power and generate CO2 emissions and so on. And this heat also cause a problem, the, the system integration. So if you put in this small, everything together, with the limited space, if you have heat, you have the jet, they have the displaced them. Then also the heat actually uh, limited the lifetime of the device because your if your phone consistently um, in the high temperature, they certainly damage the device. And this is the headache for those power for designer. And then the people work on certainly you know the, the many many years to try to uh, improve this efficiency of power for, but this is the due to you know, the physics and imitation there. The power and fire actually working, if you look at this chart here, the input output relationship, usually the efficiency of the power and fire only work on the when you drive the signal to higher uh, power level. So they work hard, they got to pump more power out if you work less. So they pump, pump power out less. So there's a lower efficiency. And, but then another problem is if you drive the power power to the higher uh, power level, actually the generator is non energy. So this is non energy going to be problem. I talked in the minutes of why the non energy issues. Now, so, and so I saw some question already in the chat to talk about the material, how the material is going to be increased. Certainly material, very important to move in those technology. Right? So, so in the power and power um, sector, they certainly continuously work on the new material. For example, organic nitride, uh, do, uh, this material, this, this kind of next generation material going to be used in power and power design. This advantage, this can provide a much higher power density and efficiency and again, and also easy for impedance matching. So, so you can see this chart here showing if you use organic nitride um, device, make this size much smaller from previous generation. And also they can facilitate different design methodology. Example showing here, these uh, use a new uh, design methodology. You can reduce the size by, you know, the 10 times. So those are certainly moving around. The people work hard in the material science and also the device uh, processing the company, many company work on those. But this circuit still has the issue. So the, you, you cannot solve the material and only provide the material side, but they can't really have to work on the circuit design. So, so one, this just give you some examples here. Um, one example called envelope tracking. What is the idea? Very simple, actually. If you look at the power and fire, um, the, the conventional PA, usually we have the signal, uh, by the way, the signal we transmit is called um, magnitude, the envelope and the wearing envelope, which, which is your signal, you know, the magnitude changing because the information changing. I right? said, so for example, your voice could be higher or lower and your music and in the different tunes. So those cause the envelope actually changing. And so those type of signal and transmit through the amplifier and then amplifier generates signal radiate, radiate out. But usually you put in the fixed power supply. Right? So fixed power supply constantly provide power to the amplifier. But your, your transmit power, uh, the signal actually varies, the amplitude varies. And if you constantly supply, then part of the simple, obviously those part of the power um, wasted. So this the this fundamental this is simple illustration here. And idea of the envelope tracking is try to do say okay why we don't change the power supply. 
So according to the signal, right? So you detect the envelope out and say, okay, I design another power supply instead of constantly provide the same voltage. I change the voltage according to the input signal. Then your power certainly saves those. But this sounds very simple, right? But that's not the easy. So you have to then the question is how you design the power supply, the, the envelope tracking power supply. This is a lot of work in, in there. You need to do much more efficient on this way. So basically, you shift the, quest, the problem from the VA to this side. And this is certainly work in the low uh, countries, in the low power, uh, for example, in handset and the, the relatively narrow bandwidth um, scenario working pretty well. The second um, the example here just showing called thorium for if you. Some of you may heard, some may not. Basically, the idea is try to utilize the called quarter wavelength transmission line theory. I think some of may you already learned. So if you say, okay, transmission line, simple transmission line, you can make this transmission line, make a cable, quest cable, or you make a, by the max strip line piece of the metal, right? So if you set the transmission line, there's a characteristic impedance called Z0 here, which is a described behavior of those transmission line. Then if you cut the transmission line as the quarter of lambda, which is quarter wavelength lamp, you fix the lens. If you terminate the transmission line on one side, say, say the impedance is called Z2, and then you look at the inside from those uh, ins uh, input, uh, input side, then there's a relationship between these three parameters, Z0, Z1, Z2, uh, by this equation. Basically, that Z0 character impedance squared equal to Z1 and Z2. So how you play around this, so we can utilize this characteristic. What do we do here? We put the two PAs together and like this. So I have to put the two amplifiers, one called carrier, one called peak. So these two amplifiers basically the same, share the same input, but I only turn the one PA and at the one at the at a certain time. So what I do is say when the low power, the power relatively low, I only turn this one. And then the output side is a connection with the transmission line, quarter away from the transmission line. And the peaking amplifier off. So it's a little bit technical here, but in the, the peaking amplifier off, which is a, this a, like a, like the impedance here is infinite. So it's just a turn off, right? So this output only connected to this 25, 25 ohm uh, transmission, uh, the load here. And this is a 50, this is 35, then the convert this is 25. Then this is a 25 here. as According to this equation, the 25 here, there are the 50 here, then actually turn out this 100 here, right? So the equivalent to 100 here. Then I, I drive this amplifier to the saturation and under the 100 ohm and load. Then after this saturation, then I turn the second uh, amplifier. The second amplifier, when the second amplifier turn, this is provide a 50 ohm and load here. So because this this original 25 is now adding another one, basically the parallel, you put it the two parallel, this is 50, 50. So this became 50 and equivalent is 50. Then if this is changed to 50, then again, this is the 50 squared divided by 50 is give you 50, right? So this basically, these um, load reduced. So the, at that point say, okay, I have load reduced. Then you say, okay, my load reduced, my carrier continue provide power, then the peaking provide another power. So how this this works is it continues, you know, these these two MFR simultaneously now provide power and to the output. Then you look at efficiency point of view. If I using one single MFR and the efficiency curve like this. So I go into go the peak, then you got efficiency. And so, as we talked about earlier, so this signal is the magnitude vary. Right? So if I have the signal and to average and um, average uh, the power actually pretty low, so the efficiency very low. Now we first turn this this carrier first. That this carrier goes to the saturation. This efficiency curve like this, right? So go to the top here. Then I turn the second stage. I turn both. Then I go to the drop a little bit in the middle. Then come back again. So which means my average efficiency is going to be increased. Right? So this is a simple trick to do this this architecture widely used in the uh, current uh, wireless space stations. Obviously, the design itself is a little bit more complex. This is just a basic concept to give you an idea how it works. The another idea is that it's, uh, we talk about, say, the the power for itself still difficult to design is analog circuits. Right? So how we can jump out the box 
from the outside of the box to look at how we can improve the system. So this is the main problem with the PAs is that if we continue drive the PA and the saturation is that this create a nonlinearity issue. So because the gain drop on the higher power level. So if you look at the linearity point of view, this like input output relationship of the PA look like this. So it's linear, then it goes to bandage, right? So it's a nonlinear. Now we jump out of the box and so say we cannot solve those in the inside of the PA. Why we don't? Because we look at in the end of the day, the transmitter basically transmits the signal, right? So from a signal processing point of view, and we can create another box called a digital pre distortion, so called DPD. What does DPD do? DPD basically is a nonlinear function, just using another nonlinear function from a signal processing point of view. I can generate another nonlinear function, which is a nonlinear function behavior as the exact inverse of the PA. Okay, then what do we do here? We signal first pass, you know, pre distorted, which is on purposely and makes it nonlinear and behavior like this, then pass the second box, then band back. Right, the net from original input to output became linear. So this the concept is very, very simple, right? So then benefit of this to, you can say, okay, if I use in DVD put in here, I can drive the PA with the high efficiency region, which is generated non-energy, but the non-energy compensated by this. So if you put the two box cascaded, actually, I have the linear amplification from the input to output, and also the PA work on the very high efficiency mode. So then there are people or or basically requesting the, you know the DPD you put in the DVD box, the DVD consume power too, right? So there's going to be extra cost. But unfortunately, there's a PA usually one running very high power. But the DVD we can implement in digital baseband, digital circuits usually much more efficient, so there's a low power. So there's in terms of power budget, those are much lower. So this then you say 10% of this, you still gain uh, a lot of power uh, there here. So in, in, in terms of the, the total system efficiency, you put in the DVD and actually can uh, enhance the efficiency over 30%. So then actually this technology became one well, of the key technology using in current 4G system will be used and continue using 5G system. So you can think in this benefit for this currently even the 4G network has about 7 million and uh, base stations um, deployed. So each of the 10 K, 10 kilowatts of power, you can think in 30% of those budget is significant, uh, the benefit for this. And then finally, I give you another example here is particularly for 5G, um, try to improve again from the system um, perspective to do this. Then current system, they use in single kind of single antenna approach, which is, um, or, or two antennas to cover uh, 260 degree kind of range. So you, you radio the signal to the air when the receiver um, uh, come in, so you receive signal. But this actually is not efficient because if there's no user in this region, you still uh, radiate the power. It's not really useful, right? So, and so then the idea of trying to do is why we don't use, don't point this signal to the user directly, but that's not easy, right? So one way to do that, we, we have to use in multiple antennas. So how we do this, so basically, if you know a little bit of antenna or, or any uh, radio, so you put in the antenna, the antenna pump out the signal, which is like an electromagnetic wave, right? So like a sine wave. So if you put in the antenna to different space, you get the, get the certain space, and then you add the certain location, the wave transmits from the antenna to the location. And if the, if the different uh, distance, certainly the wave going to be um, either in phase or out phase. If the in phase, they're going to be added on together. If the out of phase, they subtract, right? So this is basically create, if you put many, many of those together, so they're going to be in the air, you will see the energy, some part of the constant, you know, the add on together, some, some part actually constant. So in that way, you can generate, you can um, put in the energy as a certain direction, the more strength and certain direction, the constant. So in doing this, so you can um, purposely point the strength signal to the user. When the user move, you can move in a different direction. So this is much more effective. Right? So this is a simple calculation doing this. Okay, if I using one antenna, I point those, I rest of the, the signal actually wasted, right? But if I use multiple antennas, um, then you can concentrate the signal. 
then even use multiple tenants, each of the tenants, the power much, much lower. So you can save an or it will save a lot of power. So that's uh, what's in, in the current system, the use in omni direction kind of transmission. But in the future, in 5G, they use to build uh, multiple tenants to build the directional beam to the user. And obviously this is a little more complicated system. You need better management and so on. But overall the efficiency, the significantly improve. So just this just give you some flavor of the what we are and micro engineer can do. There's a summary here to say the 5G certainly they they connect more devices or items to the network will make huge change to our life, right? To the system. And and 5G certainly can help to reduce the CO2 emissions. Um, but 5G itself actually need, need to be green and uh, sustainable. Right? So they are microengineer certainly play the critical role here. So finally, just to show side, yeah, save our planet. We really need to do something about it. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Andy, for the very nice presentation. So now all the presentations are completed. So I would like to turn the podium to Professor Michael uh, Lasso, and he's going to actually collect the questions from the chat and uh, you know handle the uh, Q&A session. And also feel free to post your question uh, even during the Q&A session. So Michael, could you please go ahead? Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Nuno, Maurizio, Andy, for these uh, very inspiring talks. Irina, what uh, you said, one has the impression that uh, I made the right decision when, when I was younger to, to work in this uh, field. Uh, we have seen many exciting uh, applications of microwaves in uh, our near future. And uh, we uh, have also here the students who we, who will become in the professionals to make them uh, happen. Um, uh, it's time for the students to, uh, to uh, for, it's time for the students' questions. They have made some of them uh, in the chat. I will try to uh, make all of them. Some of them are for just one or two of you, but uh, feel free to, to, to answer as you, as you wish. Um, we have here a question related to materials, uh, and Gabriel asks, will uh, the semiconductor and rare materials crisis lead to creative new production technologies? Has it had a bad impact on research in the last couple of years? Anyone? You know? Yeah, I'm going to jump in. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, um, yeah, so from the power for, as I mentioned, the power for point of view is certainly there's new material and uh, help, right? So they're going to be, we need more efficiency and more power and density and smaller size. And this integration is certainly important. Um, there's a material science work this, and this is an important uh, area. Another question for Maurizio. Um, which are the challenges in the semiconductor and microelectronics areas for the research in the uh, 60 terahertz communications? Actually, I guess Nuno can also uh, have an opinion on this. Mauricio, I think he's muted. I think that somehow uh, they are muted, Nuno and uh, Maurizio. Let me see if you, we can un unmute them. Let me let's take a look. Uh, um, let me unmute uh, Nuno. Nuno, I think now he's working. Yeah. Okay. yeah, okay. And Maurizio, I think that let's keep all the speakers unmuted, uh, probably during the Q and A, so that they don't have to change uh i don't oh Maurizio. okay let me see unmute Maurizio. i just unmuted you and also ending oh it's fine thank you yeah so i guess i, I suggest all the speakers are unmuted yeah from now go ahead what is yeah, you want to start was about the, ta the challenges in the semiconductor and microelectronic areas for 60 terahertz communications but there is a general uh 
um, challenge uh, when you want to go um, up in frequency and keep the product as let's say commercial, not a specific for let's say space or something like that. That is cost. I mean, what we want to do is uh, develop some uh, devices uh, that are uh, cost effective because that's the only way to to have a large market. I think there was a slide presented by Nuno uh, mentioning the large number of devices, or wireless devices that we are going to uh, produce according to estimate in the next uh, few years. And there are uh, several billion of devices. If you want to do that, of course, uh, you cannot have a price for each device that is uh, uh, 1,000 euros. So you need to have uh, some cost-effective uh, uh, device. And to get cost-effective devices, you need to work uh, of course, uh, on the technology that you implement, but also on the design, you need to keep the implementation simple, the fabrication simple, and this is uh, probably the, the most important point. When you move up to, uh, let's say, millimeter waves or uh, sub terahertz uh, range, this becomes critical because uh, components miniaturized, fabrication tolerances become uh, uh, a, a real challenge, and so having a cost effective uh, uh fabrication process uh, still is a uh, is a bit of a of a dream so that's something that uh, we need to keep in mind uh, for let's say the upper frequencies of 5g or even more for 6g when uh, where we will move to uh frequencies above 100 gigahertz we have one question also yes uh, i can i can also uh, yeah. share yeah. some some ideas but um uh, on top of what Mauricio said, I think it's it's very important that uh, we move towards uh, an option of biodegradable semiconductors. And uh, exactly because the IoT sensors are going to explode. And another topic that we did not address uh, today, which was on the CubeSat um, approaches, which is strongly RF uh, related, and microwave engineers related. Uh, if you will see that the uh, amount of CubeSats, uh, different companies are sending uh, over the air, uh, after three or four years, they will be burning in the atmosphere. So um, we should be careful about the huge amount of pollution that we are going to bring to the atmosphere of Earth, unless we change the paradigm and we also move to other type of semiconductor solutions that actually can be biodegradable and can be reduced the impact on, on pollution in, in the earth. So I think there is a, a very good uh, challenge in, in, in front of us for, for material and, and, and components development. I think it's very, very interesting. Mm -hmm. We have one question on wearable uh, wearable devices. Uh, the student says nowadays we have, for example, watches that can measure the pulse rate and other parameters. Are modern devices accurate enough to be used to monitor people which, for example, have uh, heart diseases? It's a question about accuracy. I don't know who may uh, feel competent to answer this question. Maybe I can start. Uh, for these kind of devices, we need to separate to different uh, levels. One is the uh, data collection. I mean, we need to collect data in the uh, most uh, po uh, possible accurate way. So we need to improve the accuracy in the way we collect data. But then there is another level that is the interpretation of data. So if it is done by a human being, by a doctor, of course, the person can have the experience uh, and uh, the background to, to do that uh, in, a, in the best possible way. If you use a machine, uh, that, that's, the, that's the problem. I mean, it can be uh, a good algorithm or it can be just uh, a simple model. And that's uh, what can make the difference. Of course, uh, we are going to a world uh, with a significant uh, uh, impact of uh, artificial intelligence. And so this is second phase, that is the data interpretation can improve a lot in the next few years. Uh, nowadays, it's hard to say if uh, the interpretation of data is, uh, is good enough. Probably the measurement uh, is uh, decent. The interpretation is still you know, questionable. That's, uh, that's what I, I can say about uh, uh, wearable devices for medical applications. 
Yeah, I, I can also add something. Uh, I think this is also a very interesting topic uh, for microwave engineers because as, as I showed and, and I saw in some of the questions they are being put in here in the chat, the, um, these devices should not have a battery again. Uh, I don't know if you are familiar with pacemakers, but uh, if you have a pacemaker each uh, three or five years, you have to go to the hospital and uh, change the battery. This is, is nonsense in my, in my uh, uh, idea because uh, I really think we need to move to sensors that are inside the body and do not need a battery for operate. But uh, even though uh, on the topic of the accuracy, uh, I fully agree with Maurizio, but I think we are opening a new era where we probably do not have a very good resolution, very high level uh, medical standard, but at least these sensors can give you warnings. And if they can give you warnings, you can um, you can go and run to the hospital or to the doctor faster than if you don't have the devices. So I think like the mobile phones or the, the watches that are already digital and, and have a lot of sensors, I think in the future, we are going to go into, into this direction and, and some of the RF uh, activities being done all over the world and <clears throat> there are several universities either in Europe or US uh, and I believe in, in Asia they are also working on, on these topics where actually uh, you can have a sensor inside your body that is monitoring your uh, um, sugar in, in your blood or it's monitoring your uh, number of, of um, uh, cholesterol and so on. And, and this goes to your phone. Imagine that you have that. So you can actually, uh, I normally joke with some of my students, you can be eating your dessert and, and your phone is saying, stop, don't, <laughs> don't eat more. So I think there are a lot of things that despite they are not very precise, that can give you these warnings. And this is really a, a new revolution we are going to foresee in, in, in the recent years, in the future years, yeah. We have here a very te technical question of, uh, as well. Would you comment on the prospects and challenges of SO, S-A-W, B-A-W sensors? It's a very technical one. Uh, well, I, I think, think that that's for Professor Bozzi. Actually, I'm not an expert of uh, acoustic <laughs> wave devices. Uh, as far as I know, there is some uh, attempt to avoid them in uh, uh, in mobile uh, systems because they have anyway a, a, a size that is not negligible, but uh, still it seems they they are. Uh, mandatory to get enough uh, rejection, out of band rejection, especially for filters. But I, I really, it's really not my area. I mean, I have a, just a, I have a quick comment. Is that actually, you know, in in the city where I live, Orlando, there's a you know a site uh, belonging to Cuomo. They are mainly their main main business is to build a surface acoustic wave <coughs> devices like a filter. You know those devices actually they are doing really well i mean they are like a, i think they are highly engineers like crazy is <laughs> so literally every if engineer a student we have at ucf you know they basically they are very welcomed you know and hired by by this company so at least this is a really good area at this yeah at this moment we have another question for nuno about the um, uh, embedded medical de devices the student uh, asks how to select the most appropriate frequency band for wireless power transmission and how about uh, the power transmission efficiency. And uh, he or she adds, what is the biggest challenge of, on the, of the wireless power charging for the body embedded medical devices or sensors? Yeah. It's it's a very nice question, and uh, I don't know if there is already a, a clear answer to, to those questions. So the first, what is the best frequency? I think that depends a lot on what type of embedded systems you are looking for and where you are going to include them. If it's inside the heart, it's, it's outside the heart. Uh, for instance, if it is under your skin or if it is deeper in your body, 
And there are several works, most of the works being done recently, it's quite low frequency, so more inductive coupling uh, approaches in that situations. Um, and there are also some works done in UHF and VHF um, frequencies. But as, a, as uh, I, I've not been working directly on these topics, um, I have I, I started recently working to in these embedded um, systems, and I believe uh, there is uh, already a large number of of, of uh, activities to do before we select the best frequency. And and again, I say. The best frequency is not the same for the whole body. It depends on when you want to put your sensor. The second question you, you raise is very important for all wireless power transfer systems, which is what is the efficiency? And this is a challenge. So the efficiency depends on the distance you, you want to cover and depends also on uh, what type of, of energy you want to broadcast to your sensor. Well, um, if you go to very low frequency inductive coupling solutions, we are talking about efficiencies that are approaching 90%, which is quite good. Uh, if you go to far uh, long range uh, distances, the efficiencies can drop very fast. And um, sometimes we, we see an efficiency of two or 5% and you say, okay, so we are losing power, that's true. But in certain situations, this 5% of energy is important. And um, there are several applications in space, especially in space probes, where uh, you can power up those probes even if you lose power, but you can continue to power them if you don't have a wireless power transmission solution. Then you cannot, you cannot power them and you lose the, the experiment. So uh, again, this is not a simple... Uh, uh, discussion, but for uh, embedded systems, the efficiency, if it is low frequency, I think you can you can get good results. If you increase frequency, the the efficiency drops very very fast, depending on on the frequency, of course. Uh, and I don't remember the third point. So these were two of them. The third one. The third one what was about the biggest challenge of the wireless power charger. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, the biggest challenge is exactly the efficiency, <laughs> exactly. So um, one one thing that we have been working recently is try to design not um, high gain antennas in the traditional sense of telecommunications, but try to design focus beams. Um, if you do that, the, the, there are some experiments done uh, also with radio frequency colleagues for breast cancer detection um, and they actually design uh, very specific lenses microwave lenses that so that you can focus your 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 signal on a specific point and in, in those cases is the cancer uh, part imagine that we can use and in my group we are trying to use the same concept not for radar approach but for wireless power if you can create this focus and if you can put your sensor exactly on the focus, then the efficiency goes up very, very fast. We have some preliminary results where we show that we can have 60 to 70 percent of efficiency in these situations, which is quite, quite good for, for microwave uh, links. So um, I, I will say the, the main challenge is really how to design this electromagnetic beams and especially this electromagnetic focus. Some ideas uh, pass through these uh, electromagnetic lenses or dielectric lenses, but there are also a huge work on metamaterials and active metamaterials that probably can be used in these situations, which could be uh, also a challenge. And of course, RF and microwave engineers are in, in the focus and in the center of these activities. Eduardo makes um, a very interesting, although basic, uh, question. Uh, he wonders if it really makes sense to connect everything, to make every uh, single device smart and connected in the uh, 5G scenario. Do you have any opinion on that? Do we have to do everything smart? That's a good philosophical question. Uh, le let's say that uh, I believe that there are 
several areas where uh, uh, the connection of objects can improve the quality of life. Biomedical area is uh, one of them. Uh, autonomous driving is probably another one. And uh, of course, uh, we will also find uh, several applications that are uh, driven more by commercial reasons than uh, by a, uh, more than by a need for uh, for for the for the application. So in some cases, uh, the market will propose uh, uh, some objects connected to the internet that will become uh, fashion, but maybe not very useful. But besides them. We have many, many applications that really can improve the quality of life. So I'm quite optimistic on uh, on this point. Yeah, maybe maybe I, I a bit on that. I think if you look at the human civilization, right? So if the if the every single individual there there's a society, right? So they they they, they um then you have the individual has a brain. Obviously, they make better, right? <laughs> so. So if it's every single device is they have their own brain, so socially they have to manage themselves and also they get it better or behave better, right? So currently basically individual devices still kind of dumb. We make, we call them smart, actually it's not smart at all. So that's why the edge computing, those things became more important. The car uh, certainly move in that direction, but the car still need, need some of the, um, network to control those. And if this car can really become self, self uh, contained smart system, that will be much more, right? So much more uh, important, uh, useful. So I think, yeah, this is basically, we talk about smart world already, but actually this world still not smart at all, <laughs> compared to previously. But I think the technology moving there, right? So. <laughs> Another student makes a, uh quite recurrent, uh, recurrent uh, question. Uh, he or she says, as the RF signal brings not only information, but also energy, how about its impact on human body and health? Bruno, perhaps you? Well, I can start, but the others probably can also <laughs> add something. Uh, I, I believe that um, in, in this moment, all the, um, safety values for uh, SAR uh, have been uh, kept uh, quite uh, inside the, the safety margins, either for communications or for the already existing um, solutions for wireless power transmission. Um, nevertheless, this is a concern of the society. Uh, we have seen for 5G that there was an increase number of, of complaints about 5G base stations and so on, but I don't think it makes sense uh, for now. Um, I think we uh, will move faster to higher powers. And in wireless power transmission, there are several applications where we are talking about kilowatt transmissions. But in those situations, uh, there will be no humans in the loop. So um, in humans or animals in the loop, which means that um, I, I strongly believe that the standardizing bodies like FCC or ITU and, and so on, um, they are very carefully uh, when uh, defining the maximum amounts of uh, power values um, that we, we can use. Uh, of course, each time we are uh, designing some of these solutions, and this especially for students, we have to take precautions. So uh, I can give an example. We are now testing for a project. We have a 40 watt transmission system for wireless power transmission. And of course, I do not let my students to switch on the system uh, be before they leave the underquake chamber, because um, this is not um, easy and this is not uh, uh, free <laughs> in terms of of um, uh, impact. But if you take the protective and the measures, I think there will be not a problem, uh, even for the overall society, uh, there will be not a problem with that. One thing we know, and this I think it's it's important to say, is that microwaves eat um, 
uh, our body. This is known in the microwave oven, like Maurice just showed, and uh, that we know. And if you integrate over time, uh, even if it is low power, but if you integrate over time, you you going to eat something. If that will have a you a bigger and, and more complex impact on your body, um, I think if we are below the, the safety margins, there will be not a problem in, in this situation. The students uh, also have questions on career development. Uh, one student, for example, asks, could you please inform me, inform me on how to join a career in the cellular mobile networks field with no previous experience and what are the different roles available there? Uh, and he's uh, speaking from Europe. I will relate, uh, relate that perhaps with a general question, how important is to follow a, a degree in master or even a PhD degree in our field to become a professional in, a, in an industry? Any advice for the student? Maybe, maybe I start. <laughs> Yeah, I think the, the 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 whole world changing. Right? Technology changing, the society changing, everything changing. I think people need those knowledge. In my own view, is knowledge uh, exists there. It's not, you know, like the fifty years ago, you had to go to the library to find all the knowledge. You find a book, you read, you find knowledge. Now, you take five seconds, you go to the computer, you can, you don't know what to do. You're going to uh, go to YouTube, telling you how to do it. So there's this is society sort of changes. They're going to be changing the whole education system and how we teach people and as a professors and also as a student, how you learn the, what the skill is. My own view, I think the most important thing for building your career, you need to learn how to find solution. So that's the problem solving, right? If you find the problem, how where you get the knowledge to, to solve the problem. So that's a methodology that's the most important in your in your career, uh, in your education system. So, so then in terms of knowledge itself, you know, say you either you can design MFR, design our circuits or design features, that's not important anymore. And it's mainly thing how you're going to do, see, understand the system needs, and then you find the knowledge and then you solve the problem. So that, I, I think that's the, that's the most important is. Second point, I just repeat the first question about, you know, the, the cellular, cellular, um, area and if you work on interest in the 5g network or whatever those area so there's a plenty of different options you can do you know either a hardware designer you design circuits you, you can find a job on the circuits you know the the, the hardware uh, part of the company provide those jobs and also there are a lot of s software part job too you know there's, there's a, we are talking about electronic engineering uh, school is no longer just a hardware it's a software and a system optimization all those things need to be taken into account even you are an engineer your circuit designer you you also need a system level uh, knowledge and you need to look at the system as i showed some example earlier the innovation not just the circuit itself actually innovation is the different levels so from top down and you know the system level innovation and to the circuit level in innovation so you don't need to worry about every single you know small piece of some student asked me so I, I learned this course I could have me find a job that's not not relevant at all so this is basically you need to you need to learn the fundamental then you should be ready for the job any job you can do you know like, a, like we talk about engineers compared to other pro profession they say if you engineering degree graduate you can do anything you want to but not like a you know other profession, you might a degree, you might have the limited choices. So why is engineering different? Because engineering try to find a solution. They have the scale of this problem solving skills. And also they have the mathematical foundation behind those engineering courses. So that that's my kind of uh, takeaway for those students. Thanks. Yeah, I can add a comment uh, on this. I fully agree with the words of ending. Uh, one point uh, that is uh, for sure fundamental is uh, learning the basic uh, uh, the basic concepts. I mean, learning the basic physics, the mathematics, the the basics of uh, electronics, and so on. So don't I I recommend the students not to be too focused on uh, what they like, uh, but try to learn uh, uh, everything at least uh, at uh, 
at the uh, bachelor and master level, and then maybe they can focus on uh, on a specific topic at the PhD level. But uh, a broad uh, range of knowledge is for sure very important. And the second recommendation is uh, to be open, to be open to uh, collaborate with uh, many people, people from different countries, and uh, to learn that uh, uh, something that is, in my opinion, uh, uh, very useful is uh, to spend time uh, in different countries. I mean, if you are European, try to spend time in uh, North America or uh, in Asia or both possibly. If you are from Asia, come to Europe, uh, go to North America, and this will help you to learn uh, to see and learn how other people uh, work in different parts of the world. And this is extremely useful in my opinion. Yeah, uh, let me also add something. I, I fully agree with what Ending and Maurizio said and uh, this last part of, of if you are able to move for another country for a certain period of time, I think it's very, very important. You you get out of your safe zone, and that is always challenging, and you learn much more than if you if you don't do it. But let me also add something regarding the PhD. Um, I see the PhD not um, only as an opportunity for you to improve your knowledge on a specific area, but more important on that is the opportunity for you to learn how to become a, a, a person that can think and question everything. So uh, the PhD activities allow you exactly to question what you are seeing and not take everything from granted. And I think this is also very important. And that's why I think also that uh, more innovative companies are hiring at the PhD level because they need people that goes to the meeting room and question what everybody's saying and, and, and brainstorm with, with them so that we can improve the technology, we can improve what we are doing. And I think the PhD is very important in this, in this area because in the bachelor and master you, you learn, but it's like you have already your 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 cooking menu in front of you, so you follow a rule. In the PhD, at least um, in my students, I let them came out of their minds and bring whatever they want. And I think this is very important for you to uh, grow as as a researcher and grow as as an engineer. Thank you. Thank you very much. I was uh, going to ask you some encouraging words for our undergrads who may be stuck right now at uh, very basic theory uh, problems. And perhaps uh, they have uh, heard your presentations and they look like dreams for them. But uh, you're right. You, you have uh, addressed the question very well and you have uh, uh, explain this, the importance of these uh, basic training um, as well. And you have also um, uh, highlighted how transversal and international our field is. This is quite important. Maurizio mentioned the importance of doing secondments and doing stays uh, abroad and, and, and so on. Um, a general question about uh, job op opportunities uh, as well right now uh, for a micro engineer. How are the perspectives? Uh, do we have good perspectives for job uh, placements uh, right now in Europe, Africa, and the Middle East? Job, uh, yeah, sorry. Job, <laughs> job certainly there's many companies looking for a job every day from, you know, the, the, the managers and email to me every day is looking for talent people. So this job certainly, they, as I showed, the 5G network I don't know others, but the 5G network certainly grew out very fast. There's there's a billions of devices need to make, right? So those need people to do that. Um, so they like said those not uh, traditional. You say well, you, if I learn those one uh, particular uh, course, I do the job. Actually, the job a wider range. It's not traditional. You only company not looking for only. One say I do PA design only looking for PA designer is not that they they looking for the wide range of the roles, and also there's the knowledge, and you 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 have the basic background. That's it. Once you have the good attitude to do those, you have a good skill. The people look at those things, and then if you need knowledge, you can go back to train you to do that job. I think there 
yeah, in, in my view, I think not just RF engineering, it's whole electronic engineering, those are still the plenty of opportunity there. Well, yeah, I, I can also add, uh, if, if you allow me, um, I think if you are in this field, as you saw today, IoT, 5G, 6G, satellite communications, radars, uh, biomedical applications, you you can count, uh, and I believe uh, I don't know exactly um, in certain countries what is the the demand. I know in Europe the demand is huge. The demand of uh, electrical engineers and software engineers is is tremendous. Even in my country, where our uh, number of industry is not significant, the demand is amazing for for all these youngsters. And uh, if you go to Asia, I believe it's the same approach, United States. Um, I know a little bit about South America. They also have needs for this type of uh, technical skills. Because as, as you can see, you can look around. Everything is digital. So uh, they will need you at a certain point. So, uh, and, and, and I think this is the correct point and the correct area to study at this moment. Um, and the mathematics and physics, I think there was a question on that. The mathematics and physics that you have to, to, to learn, and sometimes um, I saw my students not very happy with that. It's mandatory, not only, again, I say not only because of the content of the topics they, they give in those courses, but allows you to think in a different way, allows you to change your mind and become an engineer and to become an engineer you have to think in a more logical way and i think the mathematics and physics are mandatory to be there and if you have to go through one or two or, uh, years of of these courses despite some of them are they are hard they are hard uh, i really think they are very very important for your future <laughs> sorry oh yeah go ahead yeah, I just a quick reminder that you know uh, it's a two hours into the meeting, so yeah. uh, we probably will should end our meeting very soon, yeah. right? We are running out out of time. Just uh, perhaps one final question for Nuno. At uh, as this event is uh, uh, supported by MTT Society, perhaps Nuno, you can tell uh, the students the opportunities, the general opportunities, not uh, specific programs that uh, MTT Society offers for, for the students and the importance, for instance, of conferences and how they can uh, go to conferences, conferences and, and, and so on. Yeah, thank, thank you for this opportunity to talk about that. And um, uh, of course, uh, the educational uh, committee in MTT Society has a lot of specific grants for students, have a lot of activities for students. But uh, I want to stress uh, not only the conferences, the conferences are very, very important for for being able to see what others are doing, for being able to share your ideas with other uh, students, with other professors, to meet your idols. I remember the first time I went to a conference, I saw a professor that wrote a book that I was reading, and it, that was, for me, one of the most important uh, achievements in that year. But let me stress also that MTT Society has a lot of chapters, so there are MTT chapters all over the world, and there are student MTT chapters also. Student MTT chapters are very, very important because they are local cells of MTT in your university, in your country, in your area. So if you are a student or if you want to become a student chapter, feel free to go to our website. So uh, actually it's being shown here today. All the information is there. You can actually fill out a request to become a student chapter. What is the interest of becoming a student chapter? Well, first we support some of your activities. Sometimes it's monetary, other times we send professors to or, or, or uh, speakers, uh, they are called the distinguished microwave lecturers. They can go to your university. They can give a talk in your university. You can arrange a workshop around it and you will be included in this huge amount of activities and community around the world that can actually help you in some of these situations. On top of that, 
um, uh, Anding is also here, probably can talk about that, but uh, MTT is very active in the social networks, uh, LinkedIn, um, Facebook, MTT is also uh, active in YouTube. There are several interesting talks. Uh, some of them are more focused, more technical, others are more general, uh, so that you can go and you can learn from, from others. And we are uh, creating at this moment for student chapters, we are creating a pack of um, uh, a kit, actually call it a student kit with a lot of goodies so that you can distribute among your colleagues and you can actually share these activities uh, with us. And uh, the Distinguished Microwave uh, instructor uh, activity that is uh, actually the, the the basis of of the webinar today is another activity that uh, started uh, last year within MTT and I think it's it's quite interesting because you can actually learn again as I said uh, some of these speakers some of these uh, professors are the ones that wrote the books that you read in your school. So this, for me, it's always a pleasure to, to be with them and to learn from, from the best. I'm sorry we don't have time to answer some of the questions the students have made in the chat, but uh, we are really run out of time. Uh, perhaps it's a good idea if you all agree that uh, we create uh, a group in LinkedIn, for instance, for all of us to be in contact, for the students as well to be to keep in touch with uh, each other and to meet other students in other regions, in other uh, countries, and uh, perhaps this gives them an, an opportunity to make uh, some of the questions that uh, we have an answer. Some of them are very technical, so uh, you can take a look and if you agree and have time, you can uh, answer those questions. Um, in the group. Thank you, Michael. And I think it's time to uh, end this uh, webinar. And so this particular web page here, you, you know, resources, resource center.mtt.ieee.org. That's where we actually post, um, you know, most of our webinars, including our monthly webinar. I'm actually in charge of the monthly webinar. It's a free for anyone to, uh, to register. Uh, you actually can go to the MTT, you know, main page and register for the webinar. And also this particular DMI webinar will, will be posted to, uh, to this website and it will be completely free. So you can see that, you know, this is our, this is our first DMI meeting. So everything is free. Okay. So anybody can view that after it's posted. So it should be done within one or two weeks. All right. And, uh, you know, uh, so, you know, uh, I think that, you know, for the young generation, for the students, uh, we really look forward to seeing you uh, in our future conference and, uh, you know, uh, the microwave classes, and hopefully you become a micro engineer and hopefully that will change your life. And thank you so much. And uh, let's uh, conclude this uh, webinar. Have a good summer for everyone. Yes. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very thank much. You everybody. Thank you very much. Bye.